I walk to the beat. Is this not the height of arrogance? To record your own words for the sole purpose of quoting yourself? I hate quotations. Mr. Emerson, <laughs> this is called writing. You have made a profession of this same arrogance. This is in the brazen assumption that anyone anywhere would ever dare to quote Henry David Thoreau. Again, you mock me. I do nothing of the sort, but you are consumed with preserving your inanimate thought as though some kind of literary treasure. But your reams of pencil to paper are a hard read at best. There's, there's no structure, there's no poetry, there's no story, there's just the gush of what you feel. And isn't that exactly how we all think? You accuse my work of having no value. Well, as regards the marketplace, yes, I make that accusation. How on earth are you going to live? Who is going to publish a book about walking in the woods when the woods surround us? Who, for that matter, will buy the blessed thing? Nothing. You have written a book about nothing. Nothing indeed. You offend me again, old friend. I have created a pathway for a return to natural life for men trapped in the chaos of modern society. It is a map for our return to nature. Do maps not have a purpose in the marketplace? You build pathways where no roads are necessary. Where's the logic? Why put yourself through this? Again, you imply that I am an oddity. I would be more odd to sit down to write when I have not stood up to live. You're talking to your beans, Henry. <laughs> My beans? <laughs> Care for a bowl. Oh, yes, please. I'm famished. <laughs> Ah. Oh, wooden bowls. <laughs> I assume you carved those yourself. And the spoons. Poplar and maple. Fresh bread from my wife. Wonderful. Oh. Seriously, you need a girlfriend. You're wound up tighter than my grandfather's clock. Yes, and I, I do not want to hear another word about your wood pile. <laughs> you and your wood pile. You do realize that I was not serious about hugging a tree. I wouldn't want to see you get overly attached. Don't be absurd <laughs> or insulting at my own table. Are you now devoid of a sense of humor? I read a sign of success is to laugh often and much. Now I am without success. No, you're without a woman. <laughs> I enjoy my solitude. Why not be alone with a soft, attentive woman? You need not marry the poor girl. Solitude without morality is chaos. I aim above morality. Be not simply good. Be good for something. My dear, misguided friend, you do realize that it takes two people to be immoral. Now you accuse me of being immoral. Of course not, but I would like to see you have, you know, the potential. All right. All right. Do you want me to admit to my loneliness? I will. It is even agony at times. Is that what you wish to hear? I just want what's best for my friend. The nights are the longest, you know. So difficult. Each night I look behind the stars, hoping to find God behind them. I find no one. Each hour, every moment, it is excruciatingly quiet. The silence thunders to the point of actual pain. Well, then why? Why do this to yourself? Why this cabin and these woods, this pond, for two years? Two years and two months. And one day, yes, you have planted your feet here for a long time. If travel is the fool's paradise, you are indeed a wise man. And yet, I am at such a loss. You speak with such conviction regarding choices that cause you so much pain. I want to understand. I don't know how to answer that. For certain, something is pulling me here. Something calling me. Something in the soil. The earth. My brother, the world is full of soil and ponds and trees. You are consumed with a small raindrop in the midst of the floodwaters. And every flood begins with a single raindrop. Just as every drought begins with a ray of the morning sun. I see the coming drought, my friend. Because someday so much of this abundance will be gone. And by our own doing. How could that possibly be? Can you not see it? Can you not sense the loss? With every rail, every road, every 
bucket of mortar, we lose more and more of what we are as we search for what we will be. The horizon of society is changing, old friend. What was once a simple mountain and a sunrise is giving way to factories and rooftops. Can you not see it? I see this. You cut a tree, another grows in its place. You mow the field, the grass returns. Is it not possible that you envision a battle where there is no war? I see a battle where there is no victory. For people, for nature, for commerce. How utterly depressing and bleak. And on such a lovely morning at Walden Pond. So man can build a coach, but you fear that he's lost his will to use his feet. And what do your beans have to say about this impending industrial Armageddon? Men are becoming tools of their tools. You mock me yet again. Then I apologize. I actually agree with you, Henry. Well, that's why I bought these acres along Walden Pond. Yes, to save them from the Axemen. I share your dream, young Henry. Dream? More like nightmare. I do see a dream that invades my sleep every night. Oh, tell me that it breathes and has cherry lips, whatever it is. <laughs> I see this pond. I see these woods, but many years from now. Oh, a dream of the future. Tell me. People. A sea of people. They creep closer to these woods, stripping the land, destroying it, ripping the solitude asunder, the noise is... Endless. And then? I see houses. I see factories. And I see roads. Closer and closer the noise of it comes into these woods. I see them plowing the hillsides away. Ripping these very woods apart. And then what happens? This pond. These woods suddenly saved. Saved? How? the song of a great eagle. <laughs> Have you gone mad? <laughs> well, you asked, and I told you. You see the impending destruction of Walden Pond saved at the hand of a singing eagle. This foretold by a man who speaks to his vegetables. I should have known better. Oh, suddenly it's all making perfect sense. <laughs> Joshua, my friend. Hey, Mr. Henry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you had company. <laughs> Mr. Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Greetings to you, sir. You're the writer. Just like Mr. Henry. Not quite. I write books people will eventually read. Oh, Mr. Henry's a fine writer. <laughs> One day people all over the world will read his book. If he writes it, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I must tend to find my fireplace. Um... He talks to his broccoli. <laughs> yes, I, I am fully aware. <laughs> oh, Vernon, he's quite a conversationalist. <laughs> uh, Mr. Joshua, do you live nearby? Oh, beyond the woods. I have a house just outside Concord. A family? Aye. A lovely wife I do and three children. And how did you come to know Henry? Oh, I work for Mr. Thorough in the pencil shop. I stack the lumber for the lathe, sweep the floors, look after Henry, whatever needs to be done. Yes, seems Henry needs a lot of looking after. Oh, no. He's really quite self-sufficient. He needs a lady friend, though. <laughs> Other than his wood pile, that is. 